G'day and welcome to Nevadia. How you going everyone? This is the second of a series I'm doing with Kelly, aka Godless Granny, about an article written by the ever accurate, not misrepresentative and scientifically aware group called Answers in Genesis. This article is called 10 Sin Cursed Animals That Still Show Divine Design and you should find the first video Granny and I did together here or of course if the eye card doesn't show up it's in the description below. The first one was on the platypus and this one is on the honeybee. Why they would consider the honeybee to be sin cursed, I don't know. They're pretty important to, you know, everything. The platypus, yeah, I can kind of understand that, but bees? Really? The article starts off as accurate information about the lifestyle and life cycle of the honeybee, the communication methods, habitats, etc. The sneaky part of this article is that AIG does pretty much what every good liar does, buries the lie in multiple layers of truth. You'll see that theme as we continue on with this series. I'll let Kelly explain. The first paragraph notes that a single worker bee in his lifetime produces one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey, and yet a bee colony can produce 150 pounds of honey in a single warm season. This attests to the power of cooperation, a power that we in America are losing as we all assert our rights as individuals and forget our responsibilities to the collective group, like wearing a mask. I hear too many people claiming a right to not wear a mask, but no one has the right to infringe on the health and welfare of others around you. What's more puzzling is the people asserting this are Christians. The Jesus I learned about in the Bible cared for the downtrodden and wasn't preaching about asserting your rights. If we want to fight this virus, we all need to produce our 1 12th teaspoon of cooperation in order to produce 150 pounds of prevention in doing what we can to stop the spread of this disease. The author of the article then talks about the dance of the bees to communicate where nectar is to be found. It says, most specifically, the angle of the bee's straight run on the hive shows the bee's precise angle at which to fly relative to the sun. If the bee runs straight up the hive, the bees head straight into the sun. If the bee runs 60 degrees to the left, the bees will fly at a 60 degree angle to the left of the sun. Imagine if the bees lived in our modern world a world that is as full of disinformation as it is of information. How well could the bees function if the leaders were intentionally misleading the bees about where to find nectar? The bees would fly off in all directions and accomplish nothing. This is the situation with the COVID-19 vaccine that will be available in just a few short months. If all of us that can cooperate in getting the vaccine, we can prevent the spread of the virus further. We can finally get back to the business of being productive worker bees by doing our part to prevent the spread. Instead, we have people telling us not to get the vaccine because it has microchips in it to track you. No, it doesn't or because it was made from decades-old aborted fetuses. Uh, not really. Yes, there are cells in the making of the vaccine that did originate from cells that came from aborted fetuses decades ago. But this is nothing new. Scientists have been using these cells since the 60s to make vaccines for rubella, chickenpox, hepatitis A, and shingles. They've also been used to make approved drugs against such diseases as hemophilia, rheumatoid arthritis, and cystic fibrosis. We haven't seen an outcry from the abortion groups over the manufacture and use of these vaccines and medicines. The vaccine is manufactured like this. The viral genes to produce immunity to the coronavirus are placed in another harmless virus. That new combined virus is then grown in cells. Many current vaccines, such as those for influenza, hepatitis B, and HPV, are grown in non-human cell lines and even chicken eggs, bacteria, or yeast. But human cell lines are especially useful when working with a new virus, according to Matthew Kochi, a viral immunologist at North Carolina State University. Kochi explains, we don't know what's really important yet in how the coronavirus replicates. There's no guarantee that a non-human cell line will work immediately. Over a few years of work, Kochi says, a COVID-19 vaccine might be developed that could be grown in yeast or chicken eggs. But we don't have years. We want to make the system look as much like a human cell as we can. So yes, 
embryonic human cell lines were used to make the vaccine. However, not using these cell lines would leave humans dancing around the problem of creating an effective virus for years. We don't have years to search for other nectar when there is nectar right here in front of us with vaccines currently being developed. There is a time for individualism, but this isn't it. Take the vaccine. Be a cooperative bee. Sorry, Meredith, if I've flown off a bit from the bees, but this is too important to leave unsaid. That's okay, Granny. Going on a tangent is literally what I'm all about. In the AIG article, they ask several questions. The first one is, where did the information come from so that bees from generation to generation work together on feats such as communicating through complex dance patterns, building hexagonal honeycomb, regulating the temperature of the hive, and converting nectar to honey? Well, we all understand how animals communicate, both within the same species and from one species to another. Chemical communication appears in situations such as a bacterial colony or a slime mold. Even more complex species communicate through chemicals through things like pheromones. Bioluminescence is a type of communication used by insects, deep sea creatures and bacteria. Body language, touch and sound-based communication, such as vocalization to stamping or stridulation, are very common amongst animals. Intraspecies communication include things like bright markings to warn predators that an animal is venomous or poisonous. But how did the wiggle dance evolve? Well, it evolved in exactly the same way as all non-verbal communication evolved, through a process of natural selection over millions of years. Okay, I'm sure you're actually wondering how it evolved. Well, we don't really know. There's plenty of hypotheses, but not many actual hard answers. I'll pass you over to Godless Granny for one explanation she found, and then I'll show you the one that I found. The article also discusses divine design. It asks, where did the information come from so that bees from generation to generation work together on such feats as communicating through a complex dance pattern? This information is passed on as any other instinctive behavior is on through animal species. Interestingly, when I googled the origin of animal instinct, the first article that popped up featured bees. Jean Robinson and Andrew Barron, a pair of biology professors, suggest in a different article that many, if not all, innate abilities arise due to an ancestor learning how to do something and then somehow passing that information along in their DNA. To bolster their argument, the research pair note that epigenetic changes, non-genetic influences on gene expression, have been observed in a lab. A mouse exposed to vinconsolin, for example, experiences changes to its DNA packaging, changes that can be passed down for three generations. As another example, they note that lab rats taught to react more calmly to stress events wind up behaving in ways that influence their offspring, which in turn causes them to react more calmly to such events. Behavior that can also be passed on to a third generation. They also suggest that instinctual and learned behaviors are likely governed by the same neural circuitry, which means that it might be possible that epigenetic changes could possibly be coded into DNA in some instances, allowing a learned response to become an instinctual response in offspring and their ancestors. This is an area of science which is not well developed. There is much to be done in discovering how this process works. But one thing we can be assured of is that we do not get the answer from Answers in Genesis. Just because we don't know the answer to a question doesn't mean the answer is God. No scientific pursuit ever ended with the result of determining that God did it. No evidence of any God can be found in any scientific study. For answers in Genesis to pretend, like in this article, to have scientific answers to the questions that we find ourselves asking, only to conclude that God did it, is just lazy. Thank you, Kelly. That was actually pretty interesting. The hypothesis that I found was in the Journal of Experimental Biology. A phylogenetic analysis of dance evolution suggests, therefore, the original dancers can be thought of as a symbolic enactment of the foraging flight as the waggle run points directly in the direction to be flown. If this interpretation is correct, then the evolutionary innovation that may have led to the dance motor pattern could have initially been as simple as an outbound forager delaying her departure from the hive and performing part of her departing flight vector, including beating her wings, while still clinging to the comb. The neat figure of eight looping behavior that is so characteristic of dancing may have evolved later as a mechanism to enable the dancer to hold a position on the comb for multiple circuits while being followed. 
However, in the conclusion of the paper, it states, although there has been enormous success in dissecting the phenomenon of dance behavior, thus far there has been little progress in studying the neural mechanism involved. This is because it is an extremely hard task. Bees only dance in a hive and no one has yet persuaded any bees to execute dances in a laboratory setting, making the dance a very difficult phenotype to investigate experimentally. Learning more about the neurobiology of the bee brain has allowed us to flesh out this hypothesis. If indeed dance evolved by acceptation of orientation and learning systems, then while dance can still be described as a functionally referential signal, the form of the dance is far from arbitrary and reflects a hive-bound replay of a foraging flight. While I'd like to give you a lot more information about it, I don't exactly want to turn this video into an hour-long lecture on bee behaviour, so I'll leave more resources I found in the description below. Because we have four more questions to answer. Speaking of questions, AIG's next one is, how could the symbiotic relationships evolve between pollinators like bees and plants, like orchids, when one could not exist without the other? Actually, that's not a bad question. Well, symbiosis really depends on the organisms. For example, there are three types of symbiotic relationships, parasitic, commensal, and mutual. Yeah, you probably didn't think that parasitic relationships were symbiotic, did you? A parasitic symbiotic relationship is probably the most commonly understood. One organism is damaged by another in order to keep the latter alive. It could be reasonably benign, like hookworm, to organisms that end up killing the host, like malaria. Tick birds, a bird that eats ticks from cattle, are considered to be a parasite as they cause injuries to the cow, despite the fact it removes a worse parasite from the animal. Parasitic relationships aren't exactly clean cut. Commensal symbiotic relationships are where one organism benefits where the other is neither harmed nor benefits from the arrangement. Epiphytes, a type of plant that lives in the upper canopy of trees, have a commensal relationship with them. The tree itself isn't harmed by the epiphyte because the plant doesn't remove nutrients from the tree, but neither does it get anything in return from the epiphyte. Occasionally the epiphyte may get too big and can end up killing the host tree, as we see with strangler figs in Australia. Another example of a commensal relationship would be birds nesting in trees. Mutualistic symbiotic relationships are probably the second most famous. These are relationships where both organisms benefit from each other. Lichen is a good example as it is a relationship between a fungus and either a cyanobacteria or an algae. The fungus protects the algae and the algae produces sugars through photosynthesis, feeding the fungus. Dogs and humans are another example of mutualistic symbiosis. Dogs provide protection, a more effective way to hunt and companionship, while humans provide food and shelter. So, how did bees evolve to have a symbiotic relationship with flowers? Well, if we travel back in time to around 135 million years ago, there were no flowers. The way plants reproduced sexually was to produce as much pollen as they could and hope for wind to carry its pollen to another plant of the same species and land on the female gametes and produce another plant. As you can see, this isn't a great strategy as almost 100% of the pollen was wasted. At the same time, the ancestor of bees were wasps. They were insectivores, just as modern wasps are. However, they also ate pollen as it was very nutritious. As time went on, these wasp ancestor of bees became more specialized to eat pollen. Originally, flowers were green and brown, so it was harder for insects to find them. Eventually, greater varieties and colors of flowers evolved to entice pollinators to feed from them. Then nectar evolved as an extra bonus. As flowers evolved, so did the specialization of feeding from them, such as the butterfly's proboscis. That is how bees evolved. They started out as wasps, and then angiosperms started producing flowers, and then evolution caused both insect and plant to specialize in collecting food and spreading pollen in a more efficient way. AIG's third question is, what evidence shows the supposed evolution of the bee's complex eyes? The fact that compound eyes are present in almost every insect in the planet, suggesting that insects evolved from a common ancestor? The compound eye is thought to have started to evolve over 500 million years ago, and the basic insect compound eye has been conserved for at least 360 million years. In the journal Biomed Central, an article on compound eyes states that it is no coincidence that the most elaborate compound eyes are found amongst the best flying insects. Insect flight requires high spatial resolution as well as photoreceptors that are able to rapidly adjust to changes in visual scene. Compound eyes are extremely successful and we wouldn't be seeing them in such a large variety of insects if they weren't. I really wish they'd, you know, just do their own research rather than relying on people who understand science to explain the most basic things to them. A 
AIG's fourth question is, who designed the B with flight abilities that surpass modern aircraft? Actually, this one's pretty easy. No one. And their last totally not leading question is, why does a B's minuscule brain beat computers in resolving math problems? Well, AIG, if you read the article you linked, you'd probably find it in the third sentence. We don't know. What they're referring to is the fact that bees are able to solve the traveling salesman problem. This is when a traveling salesperson needs to go from point A, B, C, and D, and then back home. Doing it in one order may not be the most effective route, but changing the route to B, D, C, and A will go to the same places, but more efficiently. Bees are able to plan out their more efficient route faster than what a supercomputer can, which means that evolution over 135 million years gave an animal the ability to solve problems faster than computer technology that's been around for, what, 100 years? Big shocker there. Anyway, that's probably enough science for you, so I'm going to hand it over to the godless granny to wrap it up for you. Despite AIG producing a plethora of sciencey looking articles, none of them are backed by any original research. They hire people with impressive credentials, but employees must sign an agreement that they will never say anything that disagrees with their position. So even if there is proof positive that AIG is wrong on a particular point, and there is for so many things, their experts can't tell you that. When you hamstring your experts to presenting everything according to your presuppositions, you aren't learning. You're just bolstering your presuppositions. If you actually want to learn something, that's no way to be. Please wander over to her channel and click the like and subscribe button and let her know I've sent you. And of course, don't forget to do it here. But uh, you, you kind of don't really need to let me know I've sent you. That, that's, that's fine. Anyway, I hope you have a wonderful day, evening, night, whatever. And don't forget, don't give yourself the raw prawn. I also want to say thank you to my wonderful patrons, especially my $10 Redback Spider patrons, Lauren Hart, Aided Purple, Amanda Vogue, and Ross Devereux. I also want to say an extra special thank you to my $35 Irukandji patron, Zolfner. Please go and check out the first video in this series about the platypus. Lots of fun and a very fascinating history of the evolution of monotremes. And also, a reminder, don't forget to check out Godless Granny's YouTube channel. Both links are, of course, in the description below. 